everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's Friday. It's a jam-packed day. We have so much stuff going on here. Also, I'm happy to be back. Where am I looking? Here? Yeah. Straight ahead? Oh, to the right. There yeah, it is. Yeah, All yeah. right. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a really rough morning for guys who don't know behind the scenes. There's a lot going on. We got here really early, so I am trying to catch up right, right now, but I'm very happy to be on the show today to talk about a bunch of movies and news. Awesome. Also, here is Mark Ellis. Hey, good to see everybody out there today. <laughs> happy to be here. Ready to talk movie news. Yeah. You know, come closer to that (laughs) hot dog over there. Come a little closer to that hot dog. (laughs) All right, guys. Uh, Before we get started with the news topics, I want to remind you guys, we actually just dropped our Suicide Squad spoilers review. We had our non-spoilers review up a couple days ago. Now we have our spoilers review. That's me, Mark Ellis. We had uh, Perry Nemiroff, John Campia, and John Schnepp on that. Check that out on our channel now. Oh, we also have the non-spoilers one if you haven't seen the movie yet. Also want to remind you, we had a big announcement yesterday where we have a uh, app for Apple TV and the, and the Roku box. You can check it out. Just do a search for it, Collider Video. It has all our videos on there. So download that and you can watch it on your television. All right, Sinead, what do we got first? The first glimpse of Christopher Nolan's World War II drama Dunkirk finally landed online yesterday after a copy first leaked onto the internet. The pirated clip, which was only half of the minute-long teaser, was taken on a mobile device at an undisclosed theater. Warner Brothers quickly removed a few of the leaked clips from YouTube before deciding to release the entire version, which is attached to Prince of Suicide Squad opening today. Dunkirk stars Tom Hardy, Kenneth Branagh, and Mark Rylance and centers on the British military evacuation of the city of Dunkirk in 1940. Nolan and his wife, Emma Thomas, produced the feature, which which is set to land in theaters next year on July 21st. Dennis, what did you think of the teaser for Nolan's Dunkirk? Well, I thought it was a fantastic (laughs) teaser, and it's what a teaser should be. Me and Mark actually did a review and reaction yesterday. You can check that out on the channel. But it's beautifully shot. It's only several different shots. Uh, They shot this in 65 millimeter. They want to project it on on IMAX. Uh, The DP, uh, his name is Hoyette von Hoy. I I can't pronounce it. He he worked with Christopher Nolan on Interstellar because Wally Pfister went off and did Transcendence. So it looks like this is kind of the new pairing. But I liked it because it does what a teaser trailer is supposed to do. It's supposed to show you a glimpse into what the movie's about, but not spoil it for you and give you kind of the tone and atmosphere. Uh, I'm sure later on when we get the first full trailer, we'll get more of the story, but for now, I think it's a fantastic uh, trailer. Roka? Yeah, it looks great. Puts you right in the mood of what you want to see from a trailer, so I enjoy the heck out of it, and I, it got you into that place of like, because having served myself, mm-hmm. you have these feelings when you see these trailers, like, are they really capturing the vibe of what a war would feel like, what it's like to be a grunt sitting there waiting for your orders waiting to go into battle those kinds of things and so for me I think it really captured that vibe the shot of the guy walking by himself taking off his stuff walking into the ocean there's a lot of symbolism going on throughout that trailer even in one minute so I'm very excited uh, to see what he's going to do with this film because it's a difficult story to tell because the British kind of snuck away from the French and left them to the will of the Germans so they could come back and fight another day so it's kind of a controversial story to tell so it'll be interesting I think it's in the right hands of Christopher Nolan and this trailer gives me definitely a positive feeling about what the movie will look like. Mark? Well, Dennis, I'm of two minds about this trailer. One mind is pre-8.30 p.m. last night. The other is post-8.30 when on the Schmoes show, a fan alerted me to the fact that there was an extra in this trailer that maybe didn't quite live up to his A-list billing. Um, Before I saw it, when Dennis and I watched the live reaction, this thing blew me away. I loved everything yeah. about this trailer. I echo Roka and Dennis' sentiments completely where the, the, the wide-sweeping shots, the emotion you're going to feel watching this and that last scene Mm. it reminded me of when i saw the trailer for pearl harbor which is not a great movie but the trailer you just your heart sank when you see what's going on what these guys are looking at the same way those kids playing baseball and they looked up and they saw those japanese warplanes Mm. going by i felt the same emotion it was an incredible feeling 
And then I, I, I commented on the Schmo show how that scene was so great because usually you find a couple bad extras. And, and here it was like, but, but they all played their role so well. And then I was looking at our chat last night and some fan was like, oh, you should watch that trailer again. There's a dude. And so I was like, all right, I'm, we're going to go to break. I'm going to watch the trailer. And then this guy's face. Holy crap. I feel bad for him because I know being an extra is tough. You just they feed you nothing but red vines and you're there all day and you do like 100 takes. But my God, dude, you got to put on a better show than that, man. Man, it totally takes me out of the. Tra- I can't watch the trailer anymore. Well, I cannot yeah, well, watch. In Roka's it. world, it's Twizzlers, not Red Vines. That's right. Nasty, disgusting he, plastic Twizzlers. If he'd had a better, if he'd had Twizzlers, I guarantee he had a better <laughs> face on for that kind of stuff. Get that man a lunchable. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> Can I offer a defense here? Yeah. Real quick. A, I've been an extra on a fil- war film in Wind Talkers. That is tough. To, to maintain the stuff because you never know when the camera's on you so you always but you're right when you turn off is could be the wrong moment and people catch you make fun of you second thing is I've served with people just like this who are that incredibly weird and stupid and do that smiley face in the middle of a war or battle or, or a games and you're just like what is wrong with you and so I'll buy yeah, that because I have heard stories like people they just started like they just start laughing yes. like in Vietnam because there's just there's no other emotion you can possibly have mm-hmm. so I'll buy that but but this is an actor so <laughs> come on <dude>. Sinead <laughs> how, how'd you feel about this teaser trailer well Christian was really great to me so he let me watch it all the way through before he pointed out the extra he was like you know you just watch it um he's and showing then, that to random people on the street yeah, yeah no now I, I can't watch the trailer without seeing him because i think it's hilarious um and i've also been an extra before so it makes it more funny but yeah. um the last the last shot my heart was pounding like it was actually really really intense and this is only like a tiny little snippet mm. i can't even imagine what a full length uh, trailer would be like but this looks so good yeah, and then Christopher Nolan, uh, he's one of my favorite directors. Yeah. I mean, even if I criticized like certain parts of Interstellar, I didn't love it, but he was I respect the ambition that he has when he makes movies and he's a fantastic filmmaker, so anything that he puts out I'm interested in. This isn't exactly in his normal wheelhouse, though, like a historical war film. Uh, how do you feel about that, Roka? Yeah, it's. I'm excited for it because I think what he does is he tackles these topics, and what you say is right, Dennis. He's ambitious with his stuff. You know, even in the Dark Knight series, whatever you feel about the last part of the trilogy, the first two were fantastic on their own. Then you have him tackle Interstellar, which I personally love very mm-hmm. much for what they're able to do. Yeah, you could argue about the end result, but when you're on, when they're on the different planets, the way he's able to convey time, convey these large ideas. Ideas and make them very um, um, connectable and uh, for you as a viewer you you feel they get small even though they're big you know they become personal I think he does a great job with that in his films and this the sound it's mm-hmm. so brilliant the yeah. sound of the mm-hmm. planes mm-hmm. that the slow build to the sound you know what I'm saying yeah. and, and it gets you into that vibe of like okay this guy understands He's talked to people. He knows what war sounded like. You know, we saw that in Band of Brothers, right? We've got a whole new view on World War II through Band of Brothers. And I think what we're seeing just in this one-minute trailer is Christopher is, is approaching this with the right reverence and the right understanding of what war was really like for World War II. Yeah, there's no music in this trailer. Yeah, no. It's just sound effects. You hear the waves. You hear, mm-hmm. obviously, the planes. It, it's, it's, it's not trying to uh, create an emotion with music. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, he, it, uh, he's that rare director who you always get up for going to see his movies regardless of what style is or what the genre is. I mean, even before he did the Batman movies, when Mm -hmm. he did the Prestige or Insomnia or Memento, anything like that, he's he's one of those rare guys that you line up to go see. You don't even need to see a trailer, and he doesn't give away a lot in his trailers, but it doesn't matter because you put the name Christopher Nolan and you give me a minute like that, I am totally into this movie. Yeah, Yeah, because when he did Interstellar, it was also very similar where they teased it. I didn't love that one as much because it was a lot of stock footage and not Mm -hmm. actually footage from the film, but this one is is, Mm -hmm. is all all from the film, and it kind of sets the mood for it. Yeah. Do you think the removal of music it's it, it's it puts you in that because we're moving into that kind of virtual reality thing do you think the filmmakers are consciously trying to do I, I don't know if where you a, are viscerally experiencing the, I don't know if it's a virtual reality influence okay. I think it may be kind of a uh, influence of documentaries ah, you know yeah and, and having that feel because okay. you see a lot more handheld stuff nowadays yeah. you see a lot more you know kind of rack focusing and all that stuff right. yeah, I mean we, we live in a world where a lot of the things that a lot of our entertainment is very quick cuts it's a lot of loud music and it comes at you so fast so when you see something it's just like this this open shot and there's no anything there's no sound you just hear the wind blowing it gets really creepy and you wonder what's just on the horizon and for these yeah. guys it's it looks like hell yeah. all right what's next 
A major Hollywood milestone has been met, and it's been a long time coming. After Selma, director Ava DuVernay became high in demand, fielding interest from a variety of projects, including Marvel's Black Panther. She eventually landed on Disney's adaptation of A Wrinkle in Time, making history in the process. With A Wrinkle in Time, DuVernay has become the first African-American woman to ever direct a film with a budget over $100 million. The adaptation, written by Frozen's Jennifer Lee and starring Oprah Winfrey, recently received a tax incentive to shoot in California and with the filing came the revelation that the budget for the movie exceeded $100 million. The report comes from woman and Hollywood blogger Melissa Silverstein. DuVernay has to, since taken to Twitter to thank Disney for the opportunity and also to express dismay at the fact that this took so long. She wrote, Not the first capable of doing so. Not by a long shot. Thanks to Disney Studios for breaking this glass with me. Followed by a shame. Hollywood and audiences have missed some wonderful voices. High hopes for change. DuVernay's A Wrinkle in Time adaptation is slated for release on July 28, 2017. Mark, what do you think about Ava DuVernay being the first African-American female to direct a $100 million film? Well, I think it's a wonderful choice for her to do A Wrinkle in Time, and then making history in the process is awesome. And I love the way she described it, where you're breaking through that glass ceiling that's now no longer there. Ava DuVernay is one of those people where I think a lot of times you're a little hesitant to give anybody who doesn't have a long track record of filmmaking a huge budget but we've seen that recently with comic book movies with star wars movies that we can trust people who know how to tell a good story and ava duvernay is certainly capable of that if you saw selma you know that this is not a budgetary issue this is somebody who has a lot of talent who's got a great vision a great voice in entertainment so her doing a wrinkle in time give her 200 million dollars she's going to knock it out of the park Rucka? yeah i agree with you and i think i wonder if she's battling on two fronts as well women and african-american directors mm -hmm. i think that's really yeah. important that she's making that claim and it leaves it wide open for you to make the decision which which field she's talking about uh you know you can look go back to Catherine bigelow you can go back to deborah uh, granick who i love who did winter's bone and she just did a documentary afterwards and hasn't done anything since and she, winter's bone is one of my favorite quietly favorite independent films why isn't she being handed mm -hmm. a high-end budget like some of these like david Ayer has been handed like other people who do smaller films and then get these massive budgets to do these films so you want to ask yourself can't we have this more can't we see this more. And I think we're at this time, right, 2016, where we're seeing, with you know, we've got Hillary Clinton as the first, uh, you know, woman to be nominated for an actual, for the presidency. You know, we, we see this happening more and more with Ray, with uh, Charlie Sir, Charlize Theron in, in Mad Max. Like, we see this coming, right? And it's time. It's time that they found the, uh, that it's 50-50, found their place, had their chances, failed, and still been given opportunities. Like, all of this needs to happen, and we, we are in a transition period now as fans of film. And this is a great, great moment, and I think DuVernay you're right, Mark, is the perfect person to be handed this kind of budget and to be given the chance to create a fantastic film. Yeah, I, it was actually came to a surprise to me because I, I just didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. I thought it had already happened. And it's one of those situations now where there's kind of no excuses because now you, like you mentioned, you see a lot of these big budget movies. Look at the mm -hmm. uh, new Spider-Man coming out, Spider-Man yeah. Homecoming. You were getting a, a, someone who, who only directed a, like an indie budgeted film before. So now it's like it's not a thing because before it was like, oh, well, we don't know if these people can, you know, they need the experience of doing these. Gareth Edwards, look at him. He jumped from a movie, Monsters, which he basically did on like these prosumer cameras, edited himself, did After Effects. He jumped from that to Godzilla. Yeah. And that's a huge movie. So, you you know, you, that a kind of experience thing kind of goes out the window now. Yeah. It's now uh, studios are looking for talent, and there's definitely talented film all uh, of all genders and races out there. So I feel like now is the time for something like this to happen. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a shame that it didn't happen before that we needed so many white dudes mm -hmm. to 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 pave that way of being a small storyteller movie into a huge movie. But then Ryan Coogler, all of a sudden, he gets to go from Fruitvale Station to Creed yeah. and crush that. And I think he's going to do great with Black Panther as well. So Ava DuVernay, I'm glad that in her comments too, she acknowledged all the people that came before her that didn't get opportunities. It's always nice to know where you came from, and she's going to take it to new heights, I think. Yeah. Sinead, uh, what do you think about this news? I mean, Are you surprised that it, it like it's taken this long? Yeah, actually, I I didn't even realize that this was like still a thing we yeah. were waiting for. <laughs> um, but it's crazy, but I mean, it's still good. I mean, it sucks that it took so long, but it's still important for us to celebrate. We can't all just be upset that it took so long, because maybe this is just the first yeah, of many. Yeah, it, it, it's just kind of a sign that pr progress is being made, yeah. but yeah. just slowly. I mean, that's kind of how it always is, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. It's never something that happens overnight. Yep. Yeah, and then my thing is always going to be like, well, will she get the chance to fail and come back again? Like, mm -hmm. that's, the th that's when you've really crossed the line, is when you handed films, fail, and then they give you another opportunity with another 
the big film, which a lot of white male directors do get a chance to do. We see it in sports as well, where we see these white coaches get in and fail and constantly fail and get handed franchises over and over again, whereas a black coach gets in there and doesn't, gets only one or two chances, and then he's out of the of whatever league it's in. So you don't want to see that happen in film either. You want them to have multiple opportunities to show what they can do, because why not? If white male directors get a chance to do that, black female directors, Latinos, Asian, they all should get a shot, you know? Yeah. All right, uh, now we're on to buy or sell. Sinead, what do we got first? The gender swapping continues to be a top priority for Hollywood studios nowadays. With the all-female-led Ghostbusters reboot hitting theaters this summer, next we'll see an all-female Ocean's Eleven remake starring Sandra Bullock, Kate Blanchett, and Mindy Kaling. So let's add one more to the list. Variety is reporting that MGM is developing a remake of the 1988 comedy classic Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with Rebel Wilson attached to star. Steve Martin and Michael Caine, Michael Caine teamed up in the original Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which followed two Con men trying to swindle an heiress out of her money. The 1988 film was itself a remake of the script from Marlon Brando and David Niven's 1964 film, Bedtime Story. This new remake will now focus on two female scam artists, one low rent, the other high class, who are competing to swindle a naive tech prodigy out of his fortune. No release date for either has been set. John, do you buy or sell Rebel Wilson in a dirty, rotten scoundrels remake? <laughs> so, this is an interesting question. I, sure, I buy it because she's funny and we've seen her be funny in ensemble movies and when she has her character cameos or character scenes in different movies like Bridesmaids she's very funny and she had that show on ABC you know I have nothing but the good feelings about Rebel Wilson as an actress as a comedian what have you um, I'm just this is going to be interesting because this is her first co-main lead in a film I was going through her resume and she hasn't really been the main lead or co-main lead of any film even Pitch Perfect that's really Anna Kendrick's uh, vehicle more than anyone else's and so I, I think this is going to be interesting to see my problem is this do we have to keep remaking these films and making them for gender specific just to prove that women can do this too I really feel I'm of this place of like create your own things do your own things use it as a basis but don't do a remake like do another version of it but it doesn't have to be a remake and I think that's my problem I want women to have their own voices their own films their own things and create their own stuff and why does it have to be based on something men did before and so I have uh, complicated feelings about this because of course I support it because I want her to have as much opportunity as possible because I think she's Funny, but I think it's a dangerous road to keep walking down to remaking these male based properties into female based properties because people are going to compare constantly. And it, it was we saw with Ghostbusters. So I worry about that. See, I'm selling it, but for, for different reasons. Okay. I have no problem with the gender swapping. It's more of because Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is one of my favorite comedies uh, of all time. Right. And so for them to kind of remake it, whether it's with males or females, I'm, I'm always a bit hesitant just because, you know, Michael Caine, uh, uh, Steve Martin, and uh, what, what's her name? Glenn Headley? I don't know. Glenn Headley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did such a phenomenal yeah. job. That. I mean, it has some of my favorite favorite moments in, in a comedy like the the part where Steve Martin's in the wheelchair pretending to be crippled and Michael Caine runs across the room and and hits him with it I'm like dying laughing at this scene. so I don't know if you can reproduce yeah. something like that Ellis Dennis may I use the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> it's a very thank, funny thank movie you. yeah I'm gonna sell this too not because I don't think Rebel Wilson's talented she's made me laugh heartily in every movie I've seen her in I'm just maybe I'm just at that point where I'm just a little sick of hearing about we're gonna take this movie and remake it into something else like I thought it was a genius idea to do it with Ghostbusters however you thought the execution went down I loved the idea for it and this it just feels like you're trying to capitalize off that it's it just reeks of studio executives being like oh, okay what other 80s comedy can we remake uh let's do dirty rotten scoundrels it just it doesn't feel original it doesn't feel like they're trying to further to make it different it just feels like a cash grab to me i wish rebel wilson would take something that's a little more um i think in her wheelhouse as opposed to just remaking a comedy i don't i don't want to see it yeah watch it. it comes out and we all love it right i hope so <laughs> i always hope for you know I, I always root for comedies i always want them to be funny every movie i see i want it to be great i just don't have a lot of hope for this one and this is for everybody at home do we have the fork Bing. Bing, bing. <laughs> All right. Do we have the fork with the cork in the eye? That kind of that, that's a great moment. Yes. It's very funny stuff. You're right. I, I, you know. All right. Fine. Uh, I changed my mind. I sell it. Fine. Okay. I sell it. All right. You guys talk me out of it. I sell it now. <laughs> All right. What's next? All right. We'll be issuing issuing a spoiler alert for Suicide Squad on this story. So if you would like to not be spoiled, click ahead or come back after you've seen Suicide Squad. <laughs> All right. The Warner Brothers. <laughs> I like that. It's funny. <laughs> The Warner Brothers DC Comics adaptation of Suicide Squad is notable notable because it represents the first movie in the DCEU not directed by Zack Snyder. 
Although he kicked things off with his Man of Steel and up the ante with this year's Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, for the third movie in the DCEU, Warner Brothers enlisted Fury and End of Watch helmer David Ayer to steer the ship. However, Snyder is still credited as an executive producer on the movie and actually had more to do with the movie than you might think. In fact, it has been revealed that he directed one of the film's scenes, a flashback showing how Jai Courtney's Captain Boomerang was captured by Ezra Miller's The Flash. At the recent Suicide Squad press day in New York, Collider's own Steve Weintraub sat down with Ayer for an interview in which he revealed the scene was always in the movie but was shot in London. Because Justice League was happening, they had the uniform and all the assets to make it happen. Dennis, do you buy or sell Zack Snyder actually directing a scene in Suicide Squad? I buy it. Uh, I guess my question is, you know, did he direct just that scene that flashes in or all the stuff that kind of led up to it that's also part of that? The, basically the whole the bank stuff. Um, yeah, it ma makes perfect sense. If, if he already has the costume and, and he already is working on, let's say, the visual effects for how Flash is going to look, might as well direct this as well. Ellis? I buy it. I mean, if you need somebody to be a second unit director on something, Zack Snyder's a pretty damn good choice. And if it's just the little scene where you're trying to shoehorn a character from Justice League in, I had no problem with that scene. I actually thought it was pretty cool. So I think that there's some other meddling that probably went down when you watch the movie. It feels a little disjointed towards the end. But if we're not talking about those circumstances and just this one scene, yeah, it's an easy buy for me. Zack Snyder is a guy who, whatever you want to think about Batman versus Superman, he is doing Justice League. And so he is a guy who's very into this universe. And I don't think that that one scene is going to take anybody out and be like, wait, wait, this uh -huh. isn't David Ayer's Suicide Squad anymore. That feeling might come later in the film. But during the scene we're talking about, I thought it blended in fine. Okay, okay I haven't seen the movie yet. I see it this afternoon. So the... The idea of it, I actually sell because I think a lot of people are, ha uh, you know, coming off of B Batman vs Superman. A lot of people were upset with Snyder, upset with Vision. There's all kinds of shakeups at Warner Brothers. I think it gives a wrong, the wrong vibe to the film that it isn't on its own. It doesn't stand on its own. That's what people were pitching it that it was a David Ayer film. It wasn't part of the Zack Snyder universe necessarily. It was his own thing. And they were going to tie it in, but David Ayer was going to do it his way. Having Snyder now at least directing one scene, and that's what they're saying. Uh, it makes you think like well how much influence did he really have did he still have enough because this was supposedly done before batman vs superman right they started yes, shooting before it. it came out right, so definitely right. if he was executive producer at least at that time yeah. i bet you had more influence than he probably has now and i think it's it's, it's difficult because i sell it also dennis because this adds to the fuel to the fire of people who are upset with snyder having anything anything to do with this universe and i don't know after bat after suicide squad falling apart like it's doing now with the trailer with the trailers and the review rather the reviews I, this just gives people more fuel to to jump on top of Snyder and want him to have nothing to do with any that he has like he doesn't have the golden touch he has the negative touch on the film and so that's the danger I think and that's why I sell it because it, I really would have liked to have been 100% David Ayer's 100% his and, and what have you and, but again I haven't seen it so yeah if you watch the scene you'll see it blends in pretty well you're mm -hmm. not gonna even notice that it, you're not gonna watch it and go oh that's Zack Snyder directed this and then yeah. Also, you know, with with the films, I, I have a feeling Suicide Squad is going to do actually pretty, pretty well, mm -hmm. uh, and even long term. I don't think it's going to drop, you know, Batman v Superman dropped, what, 65% yeah. in the second weekend? I don't think Suicide's going to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it has, even though, this is what I keep saying, Batman v Superman is a better movie than Suicide Squad, but Suicide Squad is a more fun film so i think you're gonna get a lot more repeat viewing and i, I feel like the drop off next week i could be totally wrong it'd be like 70 <laughs> percent, but I, I feel like next week it's it, it, it'll be a far less than, than batman be super and may have a longer run in the long term it's interesting because they're both tied right now uh in terms of uh, rotten tomatoes 27 yeah. percent, both bbs and suicide squad so it'll be interesting to see next week all right what's next According to Deadline, Joel Edgerton is in early talks to join Jennifer Lawrence in Red Sparrow, an adaptation of the Jason Matthews espionage novel over at Fox and directed by Catching Fire and Mockingjay director Francis Lawrence. The story is set in contemporary Russia with state intelligence officer Dominika Egorova, played by Lawrence, struggling to survive the cast iron bureaucracy of post-Soviet intelligence. Drafted against her will to become a Sparrow, a trained seductress in the service, Dominika is assigned to operate against Nathaniel Nash, played by Edgerton, her first tour CIA officer who handles the agency's most sensitive Russian intelligence. The two young intelligence officers collide to trade craft, where inevitably an attraction grows that threatens their careers and the security of America's valuable spy in Moscow. In Moscow, sorry. A release date has yet to be set. Mark, do you buy or sell the Jennifer Lawrence and Joel Edgerton team up for Red Sparrow? Ooh. 
espionage, <laughs> sleeping together. Wow, that sounds cool. No. <laughs> I don't buy it. Like, it seems like a story I've heard a thousand times. It's like, oh, well, you know, I'm a spy on this team. I'm a spy on this team. But, man, you're hot. So I'm going to bang you, and then we're going to come back, and then we'll see if we can still spy for our respective countries. Just doesn't sound like a compelling premise. I like Jennifer Lawrence a lot. I like Joel Edgerton. This just does not sound like anything that's really going to get me out of bed in the morning. Now, again. What I always hope for is I see a trailer, then I'm totally in the wrong here. But just off what Sinead read me, I cannot buy that movie. Sorry. Roka? Yeah, I actually do buy it because I like this author, Jason Matthews. He served 33 years as a CIA field operative. So it's a fantastic book. I'm a big fan of these CIA books. You know, Bob Baer writes these books. Ludlam obviously wrote some books like that. And so you get this idea, John Le Carre, of course, all these are Le Carre. I don't know how they say his name. I don't want to offend You're already anybody. doing much better than my answer. Yeah, okay. so keep going. <laughs> I <laughs> just mean, and even Howard E. Howard Hunt wrote. So I'm a fan of these things. I just, because it's so complex and there's so much going on. The thing, and the thing, but the, the, the worry that I have, I do buy it, but the worry I have is are we hitting that Jennifer Lawrence? like Sat saturation, saturation point. point you know i personally am during x-men apocalypse i was like i you could you take a break for about five years like just <laughs> go off and like do some other things or do some quieter films and people love her work like she still gets nominated her yeah. films get not like all that's fine but i'm just hitting that saturation point where i want to like pull a bit back and reappreciate her again and her talent and her work and obviously but i but i'm i'm buying it because of edgerton i think also because i love the way he's handling his career, the small, slow build through these independent films. And we see that one coming out, I think it's called Loving, the one with him about the Virginia couple, which, you know, if you grow up in Virginia like I did, you knew about this couple for decades. And it's for lovers. Story. Yeah, it is for lovers. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Mark and I both did, yeah. Absolutely. We're not so, lovers, but we both grew up in no, Virginia. Yeah. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's, no, wrong there's not. I'm a spy for America, he's a Russian spy. <laughs> Somehow we fell in love. That's right. Like Russia House, yes. And so, you know, this kind of thing is, so I, I'm excited to see what they do with it. And and if it could, like, you know, give me a chance to, like, reappreciate her again in, a, in the right vehicle. For me, I, I haven't hit that point yet with her. More, I more though, I agree with you with uh, Apocalypse, X-Men Apocalypse is more, that's a movie she just kind of mailed it in, you know? And so it's like yeah. she's not giving her full effort into, so I, I'm less interested in seeing something like that. I'm going to buy this, though. I'm buying this because mainly of Joel Edgerton, mm -hmm. because he's an actor I feel is very underrated. You know, he was great. Yeah. You know, he started, uh, I think most people started noticing him in Animal Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Then he did a fantastic job in Warrior. And then Black Mass is a movie yeah. I think, I feel like he could have gotten nominated for, for a supporting actor for that role. Like he was, you know, everyone was talking about Johnny Depp and, and the makeup and all that stuff. But I felt Joel Edgerton was actually kind of, to me, the the main guy in that movie. He was great in The Gift. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gift he directed right. that as yeah. well. So I, yeah. he's one. Of, and, and remember, Joel Edgerton is not on, on in terms of star power or fame, like a Jennifer Lawrence. So if he is, because they haven't said who's going to play, but if he plays like the main love mm -hmm. interest in this movie, that that means he'll have co billing with with Jennifer Lawrence, and yeah. hopefully that will you know bring his career like higher up and he becomes more of a star. That's why I'm I'm interested in this film. That's a great point you make about about, about Black Mass, Dennis. I watched it again the other night. He's the, he's the arc of the yes. film. Mm -hmm. It's not Johnny Depp, it's him. And the journey he goes on is real difficult to watch for you as a viewer, what he goes through and, and Joel just such a, does such a great job at playing those levels in those uncomfortable moments with Johnny Depp and when he's being confronted by Julian Nicholson who plays his wife. Like he does such a great job with his internal monologue and as an actor watching that you're just like that's, that's other level stuff man what he's doing next level stuff and you, you just appreciate that with him yeah like when he's with the fbi and yeah. they're questioning him like oh why do why why are we using this guy again yeah. and like he has to justify it for himself you can see exactly. his his mind working in yeah. there all right uh what's next thor ragnarok has only been filming for about a month now but mark ruffalo has already completed filming director taika watiti shared the news on his instagram account saying he had such a great time with ruffles on the set of thor 3 this now has fans wondering what it might mean for Thor Ragnarok, with many speculating now that Ruffalo's Bruce Banner isn't in the movie very much. Back in January, Ruffalo du uh, dubbed Ragnarok a universal road movie, and in May, he said to expect a lot more Hulk. So if we're getting a lot more Hulk, it stands to reason that while Ruffalo has done motion capture work for the character, it looks like he'll be handing some of it over to mocap actors. You may need Ruffalo for the close-ups and more character-centric moments, but for running, smashing, and action-oriented bits, you can use a stunt performer. Although it would be a bit of a bummer if we don't see much banner in the new film, it should be quite the thrill to see how the movie incorporates elements from the Planet Hulk comic storyline, and how Thor and Hulk will play off each other on their new adventure. Roka, do you buy or sell a smaller role for Mark Ruffalo's Bruce Banner than previously expected? Can we keep that picture up? 
there for just a second? Is, is it, can we do that, Adam, real quick? Yeah, see that? That's what I feel when I think of Scott Mance right there in the middle. <laughs> that's the anger I have when I'm going after Scott Mance. You understand? That's, uh, that's me. That's <laughs> the Hulk Roka. So anyway, what I want to say is, the question is, do I buy or sell a smaller role for Mark Ruffalo? I absolutely sell the idea of a smaller role for Mark Ruffalo. He's such a great actor. He's brought Bruce Banner and the Hulk back to life in Marvel, and I'm so excited that he's going to be teaming up with, the, with uh, Thor to have this movie. So for me, I want him in this as much as possible. Um, so this whole idea of he's going to be less in the movie and if they're going to rely on stunt doubles and all this kind of stuff, I'm not necessarily out of the idea. Like, like believe, I just believe that he's going to be in it more than they think. And so they're doing these uh, these uh, film tricks to make him be part of the movie more. So for me, I, I sell the idea of having a, a smaller role because I want to buy the fact that he has a co-headlining role because he's him and him, Thor have the greatest relationship in the Marvel films. And that first Avengers film, when they're going at each other on the carrier it's everything right uh and one last thing i want to give a shout out to mark riley who writes these things for us because this was one of my favorite ones that he's ever written and it gets concise to the point and you hear mark's voice and i just want to give him a shout out because i never do on this show and i, I really suck appreciate it up it. to everybody that's above I, you in the movie trivia right, showdown right so now. True. <laughs> uh, i'm gonna buy it uh just because it's been long speculated for the longest time that this movie was gonna have the planet hulk storyline yeah. in it and that's a given that mark ruffalo as bruce banner was going to be a lesser role so i i don't see this as a big surprise and him wrapping this early because the movie doesn't come out until what november 3rd 2017 i'm sure they have a lot more stuff to shoot but he just bruce banner's just not going to be a big part of it right. and, and i know like for the close-ups they're going to do all that stuff if there's stuff they need to pick up, he'll come back and, and do some reshoots, but a lot of that stuff's gonna be on, on green screen yeah. anyway. Mark? Yeah, I'll buy not a lot of banner in this, but a whole lot of Hulk, because when I had the privilege of being in Hall H for the Marvel panel at Comic-Con. Oh, good uh, for you. You're welcome. Good, good for You're you. welcome, Mark good Riley. For You're welcome, you. Mark Riley. Yes. And my uh, wiener friend were there, and it was awesome. I had that look on my face, actually, when I saw the Hulk <laughs> stuff, because it looked like Planet Hulk. Like, like It looked like the effects, some of them, already looked like they were they were completed so maybe they've only been shooting for a month but it must have been some intense days where they got all of bruce banner because he's clearly going to be involved in this movie heavily we would hope he's co-headlining or the yeah. hulk is co-headlining with thor so maybe it's not quite to that level but it doesn't surprise me that mark ruffalo wrapped this early because they probably have a lot of posts to do with what he's already done so i just I, i'm ready for this movie to get out yeah. how long are we waiting over a year? Okay. Yeah. Just slightly over a Just year. a little bit. A <laughs> little bit. Next Thanksgiving is going to be fun. <laughs> All right. Let's check in with Wendy and see what the chat room is talking about. Well, they're talking about the teaser for uh, Nolan's Dunkirk. And our live viewers agrees with you, Dennis. This is exactly what a teaser should be. And so far, it looks great. Some would even uh, go see this in IMAX. The Power Tan says, some people say that Dunkirk is Nolan's saving Private Ryan. But I disagree. I see that Nolan has older influences, Kubrick influences. And this movie will be his path of glory. And Matthew B says, there's that dick extra again. <laughs> <laughs> you can't unsee him. Um, and for our buy or sell, you can't unsee that. Uh, for our buy or sell section, talking about Thor Ragnarok. So the chat is guessing that it's going to be more Hulk and less Banner, but they're hoping that regardless of a smaller role for Mark Ruffalo, they're hoping that Thor Ragnarok is going to be better than Dark World. And Jay Wilson says Roka would be a good Red Hulk. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Wendy. Now we're moving on to box office predictions. This is the Friday segment where we talk about or we predict what type top five movies are, are going to be this weekend. Uh, Roka, which one do you have? And, and why don't you give a number Okay. Or Suicide Squad opening weekend as a tiebreaker. Okay, so I'll have Suicide Squad, Jason Bourne, which I enjoy. I enjoyed regardless of what the critics had to say. Uh, Bad Moms, which is so overperforming, it's amazing. Star Trek Beyond and Secret Life of Pets. That's my five. And with Suicide Squad, I say uh, about a hundred and thirty million. I would okay. say hundred and thirty million. Mark, I'm gonna pull a fast one on Old Roka. I'm gonna take your list, but I'm going to flip flop Secret Life of Pets and Star Trek Beyond. I got pets edging out Star Trek Beyond because I think Star Trek is gonna lose more audience to the new movie Suicide Squad than Secret Life of Pets would. And Bad Moms, I do fully expect to be number three just behind Jason Bourne because not only is it overperforming from what expectations were, the movie's funny, y'all. Go check it out. Yeah, but obviously, Suicide Squad number one, and I got it. Not quite as high as Roka. I'm gonna go 123 million. Okay, apparently in a rare uh, chance, you and me actually thought alike. I actually have the same list as you, and I actually did put Star Trek Beyond at number five instead of a 
uh, Secret Life of Pets for the same reason because that's the same audience, right? Mm -hmm. And and for some reason, I like Star Trek Beyond, but mm -hmm. for some reason, it's just not resonating with the audiences. People it's are true. not going to see this movie for some reason. Um, Suicide Squad, I actually think it's going to do very well. I think it's going to do 138 million. Wow! Yeah, wow. I, I think I think that this movie is. Unlike Batman v Superman, I think this one is is more critic proof. I think people are, are going to really? go go see this. Okay. Yeah. But we have the same list, so you know what that means. Joust. Okay. <laughs> no, not. Okay, we, okay. we don't have the horses. No, Sorry, no, guys. No. Ding ding. Um, all right. Before we get into mailbag, uh, I want to remind you guys we have a schmo down today uh, featuring our own Christian Harlop Come on, versus Harlop. Jason Inman. I want to ask you guys, Roka, who do you think is going to win this match, and is it going to be a close one? I got to go with my semen. No, brother, Christian Harloff. Absolutely. I think he is. He knows so much about movies. And Harloff, when those sunglasses come on and he sits behind a mic and he starts a movie trivia contest, whether with Ellis or Solo, he just has a confidence and a swagger. Only I've only ever seen Andy take him down, so this is amazing to see him going up against him, and I think he's going to make mincemeat of Jason, who I love to death. I think he's going to make mincemeat of Jason. And I'm calling the match, so this will be interesting to watch. I am uh, very concerned about my dear friend Christian <laughs> because he's not he's not overconfident because he's acknowledged that he hasn't won a singles match in a little bit here that, you know, I've been shouldering the load in the team tournament, which is fine. <laughs> but Jason Inman is not to be overlooked, and he proved that when he beat Gray Drake, who's That's no slouch herself. So I think Jason is a formidable opponent. Obviously, I'm going to predict that Christian wins, but I think this thing's going to come down to the wire. Yeah, I also am rooting and predicting nothing against Jason Inman, but I'm rooting for mm -hmm. Christian, and I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna eke out a victory. I think Jason okay. will do pretty well, but I think Christian will just mm. get get by by maybe a question or two. All right, guys, uh, we're moving on to mailbag. This is a portion of the show where we answer your viewer submitted questions. All you have to do is email us at collidervideo at gmail dot com. Shanae, what do we got first? Ben Berkowitz writes, hello, crew. I was talking to a few of my friends recently on my podcast about films that are great, but we would never want to watch again. The Road and Revolutionary Road jumped to mind immediately. Don't get me wrong. These are must-see films. Great script, great acting, great music. Nick Cave's score for The Road is hauntingly beautiful. But to my wife, but... But to my wife, summed it up perfectly after our cinema going experience by saying she needs a stiff drink. What are some great films you've watched but you'll never want to revisit? Thanks. Roka? Oh, never ending God. story. Jesus. Uh, Rudy. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> you really, Goonies? <laughs> oh, God, I can't. What's it's, wrong with Goonies? Uh, he likes Twizzlers. So he loves boring. the Transformers movie. He thinks Pacific oh, Rim sucks. And he uh, and I hates, love the, hates the Goonies. Things. I'll give you Twizzlers. I mean, Red Vines are the white trash Twizzlers. Thank but you. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. That's yeah. Virginia no. Raisin, son. Virginia no. Raisin. I don't want to think about yeah. white trash. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Twizzlers are the better. Thank yeah. you. That's it tastes like plastic. Not true. It's, it's so better than like, any Twizzlers. Yeah. You West Coast people have uh, no idea. Melted what you're plastic. About. Uh -huh. So when they put plastic on, on it, put it out in the sun, and it melted on what used to be red licorice. Right. Twizzlers make mouths happy. Red vines make mouths say, is that wax in there? Yeah, what is no. that? What is, am I gonna get cancer eating this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say uh, my my list is Schindler's list. It's really difficult to watch a second time. 12 Years a Slave, which I went on a date to see, which was the biggest mistake. Dude, you know how to select <laughs> yeah, a yeah. You gotta get them in the mood, right? <laughs> yeah, I went one, with an English teacher, and we went afterwards and had like three stiff drinks at the Wellsbourne. Wow. Uh, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is really difficult to watch again. Dancer in the Dark, that Bjork movie, was really tough to watch uh, the first time, so the second time I would want to go. And United 93 is real difficult to watch because it's so good and puts you viscerally in that plane that you you can't help but have all the feelings and the helpless emotions at such a heightened level. You are just a ball of tears and emotions watching that movie, and it's it's difficult to put yourself yeah. through that. So all Greengrass, good. yeah, Greengrass, mm -hmm. great stuff. Uh, for me, Requiem for a Dream. Oh yeah, you know <laughs> it's watching the these people like self destruct on from drug addictions from from various different situations. It's it's tough. I mean, it has that great Clint Mansell score to mm -hmm. it that they use in a lot of trailers, <laughs> but just I I, I can't. I can't I don't know. I mean, I love Darren Aronofsky, yeah. and the movie's great. I just don't know if I can watch it. It's a tough film. Yeah. Uh, 12 Years a Slave also is, is another one. Uh, another Lars von Trier movie, Breaking the Waves, with Stellan Skarsgård oh, yeah. and uh, Emily Watson. That's a movie that's just, it breaks your heart. It's, it's, it's disturbing and dark, and just what happens at the end to her, just... Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a it's a good movie. I just I, I can't watch it again. Uh, Mark, what about you? Uh, I really don't like when I feel like I'm there. Like I'm watching the movie and I feel there and I feel very uncomfortable being in that setting. So I'm gonna go with two. Rachel getting married. Oh, uh, God. Anne Hathaway is in that. She's recovering from. I, oh, I think yeah. she she used to have like an addiction and ended up really injuring or killing somebody. And then she's at her sister's wedding, and there's one particular scene. The whole weekend is just them like hanging out with the two different families, and there's a lot of like conflict. And you just feel icky being there. She's giving a speech, and it's, you feel like you're in the crowd and just watching the speech. I just can't get over it. Then there's another one that's even worse than that, Sinead. It's called Margaret. It's called Margaret. It's got a really good cast. Anna oh, Paquin yeah. stars in it, and she plays a woman who inadvertently causes a bus accident that kills Allison Janney's character in the beginning of the movie. Mark Ruffalo's driving the bus, and he looks at Anna Paquin, and then he keeps driving, and Anna Paquin's like, she gives him like a wave, and he's like, oh, hey, how you doing? Boom, boom, boom. Then he runs over Allison Janney. So for the rest of the movie, <laughs> you're just sitting there, and it's really good performances, but the whole time I was watching it, I felt like I was searching my head to try to remember if I ever ran over anybody in a bus, and it just really felt, it just got into my soul. It's, it's still there. Uh, Sinead, is there any movies that uh, you can only watch once but you actually think are good movies? Um, Rachel Getting Married is such a good one. Yeah. I totally forgot all about that movie. Uh. It depressed the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> uh, I've said this before, but a movie that I have very little interest in ever watching is Titanic, even though I love that movie. But I cannot sit through it again and again. So when people are always asking me if I want to watch Titanic, I have a lot of friends that haven't seen that. I think it's just like slightly right during my generation and i was like nah dude you got to go find someone else to watch it like i will not watch it and even more recently is um the revenant i don't think i can ever watch that movie wow. again it's just because it's so like quiet and slow and i loved the revenant mm -hmm. but it's so quiet i it's don't so like, beautiful it's yeah but it's just like uh, <laughs> along with uh what mark was saying because i was talking about more depressing films but more the yeah. ones that make me feel icky and uncomfortable uh jason reitman's young adult Oh God! Watching Charlize Theron and no her arc. character behave the way she does—so true. Uh, it, all those conversations with like her ex-boyfriend—it's uh, just like the scene with Patton Oswalt. Yeah, all like it just oh. makes me like squirm in my seat. I don't ever. I think it's a good movie. I yeah. just don't ever want to see it. Again. Can I throw one more in? Yeah. Uh, House of Sand and Fog, which is a fantastic film with Connolly. Made me think about it when you mentioned Requiem. Uh, Connolly, Ben Kingsley. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Ron Eldard is that the guy who was in Deep Impact who went blind driving the the shuttle? I don't remember him. much from Deep Impact. Okay, well, House of <laughs> but anyway, House of Santa Fog is a really depressing film. And what it is is she, her mom, she's an addict recovering, and her mom makes a mistake on a form, so she ha so her house gets sold out from under, which is the only thing her mom left her when she died, and gets sold out from under Jennifer Connelly to this Iranian couple, which is Ben Kingsley and Shara, Shara Agadashlu, the lady who was in Star Trek Beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, and they and Ben Kingsley is this like, he, wa he has this young son and he wants to establish himself as an American because he fled from Iran when the Khomeini came in. And it's this, and it's the, it, the whole thing is like in darkness and the fog of, of, of San Francisco the whole time. And it just, it's so depressing, so depressing. And the end will break you in half. And I would never watch that again because I cried like a baby after that film. And, and look, real quick, I don't want a Monday morning quarterback anything, but John Roca, here's some other movies that were available for you to take your date on when 12 Years a Slave <laughs> was released. Uh, you could have seen Escape Plan, a fun action movie with uh, Schwarzenegger and Stallone. Oh, gosh. Uh, you could have seen The Fifth Estate about Julian Assange. Sure. Or you could have seen a little movie Movie that maybe would have served you better on your first date called Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> it was available to go see in the theater starring the Haley Steinfeld, Steinfeld Holly Hunter, I was not and you see chose 12 Years a Slave yeah. instead of Romeo and Juliet. My counter is that one won an Oscar and none of those came even close to it. Yeah, Oscar. that Romeo and Juliet was, was terrible. Was well, I think Hunger Games good. was out at that time because I remember I saw 12 Years a Slave oh. and then I watched Hunger Games after, right on. after that. Captain Phillips, hey, I'm not judging I hope the date ended up well. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. guys ended up going to a bar and drinking we afterwards. We still made out so. afterwards. So <laughs> I, I I, still got, I did all right. I did all right. Ew. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, on that note, let's move on. <laughs> Live Twitter questions. Ew. You can say. <laughs> <laughs> TMI. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Sinead will pick out a few and we will try and erase oh, that memory from our collective consciousness. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. So, Christopher Woodburn tweets. Um, do you guys ever plan to do a documentary video, or not a documentary, but a commentary video for The Dark Knight? Thanks. 
I think eventually we yeah. will, but we have so many. I think the next one on the docket is doing the Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition, which you know we planned on doing before, but we got so busy prepping for Comic Con, we kind of still had a lot of stuff after Comic Con to do. So hopefully we get to do that sometime in August, and then the Dark Knight. I'm just trying to think of what the next appropriate time to to shoot that one would be. Yeah, I mean, uh, I had a lot of fun when we did Man of Steel. I actually liked watching that movie a lot more when we did our commentary for it for whatever reason. There's a lot of Batman movies that I would love to do a commentary for. Dark Knight, Batman Begins is my favorite Batman movie of all Mm -hmm. time, and the 1989 Batman I think would be a lot of fun to do as well. Yeah, Uh, well, if you guys would invite me on, I would absolutely love to do it. Any of the Batman movies, even the ones that a lot of people didn't like. Like like, Batman, I think actually think Batman yeah, Robin would be a lot of fun. Oh, oh yeah, it's tough. We, we Just gotta, a terrible no, part. we got to sneak in some of those like Last Airbender, The Happening, oh, Batman yeah. and Robin. What are some other good like The Room? You still you still haven't seen The Room? Green Lantern? Either? No, I still haven't seen The Room. Yeah, we got to sneak that one in, and then I think we were still gonna have Natasha and Riley watch ET yes. together. That's oh, a, uh, oh, can I watch that with them and just scoff at the movie the whole time? Oh, Natasha's not a fan of oh. ET. Yeah. She's scared, <laughs> scared of the, scared of the alien. He's a, he's a pretty slimy, scary-looking alien. Like, like yeah. I'm just saying, if I'm in that movie, I might be on the side of the government. All right, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say he doesn't look scary at all. Hey, if you saw that thing on the street, you would kill it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be real here, okay? You see an alien, you've never seen anything like that before. You're not gonna give it a course <laughs> in recent <laughs> pieces. Yeah, you're gonna run. I'll run that thing over the bus. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Angus tweets. Ew. Ooh, Angus yeah. tweets. What's the coolest movie weapon for each of you? Oh, wow! Yeah. The coolest movie weapon of all time. Mm. Um. Okay, look. I'm gonna start in the genre of horror because that's where my mind goes instantly. And I think the coolest, scariest weapon that you could have is Freddy Krueger's right hand uh, claw. Mm-hmm. Like he made it himself. He clearly mm-hmm. took his time with it. He sharpens the blades just to scare the kids. That's a pretty creepy movie weapon. Uh, it would be Darth Maul's double lightsaber. That's a oh, kick-ass, that's a good one. That's a kick-ass weapon. And I, if you know how to wield that correctly, it's an awesome weapon to have in your life. Uh, this wasn't in a movie, but it was recently in <laughs> Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They had uh, one of the characters create the shotgun axe, which I thought was pretty cool. Oh, it shotgun was, it, it, was, it was a shotgun shoots. and an axe at the same time. So wow. he was hacking people and then he was shooting them in the face. You know what I would love in is one of those uh, guitar case bazookas in Desperado. Oh, you know, that'd be that'd be a lot of fun to have. All right. What's next? <clears throat> Brad says, I'm coming to Hollywood in November. What's the best theater to watch a movie in? Uh, and this is not you know paid for by anyone i love the amc prime i mean we're we yeah, no longer good. with amc uh mm-hmm. but I, I still tell people that's the theater to go to because it's not only is it nice comfortable relaxing leather reclining seats but the picture quality on the screen it's not as big as an imax but but the projector and the contrast ratio are fantastic and the sound the dolby Atmos sound that's throughout it like sound you don't realize how important it is until you start watching some action movies with in theaters that have very poor sound. Yeah, I like the AMC uh, Prime in both Burbank and Century City are my two favorite locations. I'd also say if you're on if you're in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard, the Sunset Five, that's I believe a Lamley Theater. They completely refurbished it a couple years ago. It's a magnificent place. You can get some cold beverages. They're very, really comfortable chairs. And then uh, you're like a stone's throw from the world famous comedy store, the Laugh Factory. Oh, all boy. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Roka. Uh, I would say two two theaters for me have been my greatest experiences here. The IPIC over in uh, Pasadena. Mm-hmm. It is fantastic. $28 a ticket. It's expensive. What? Yeah. Is that where you but watch 12 Years a Slave? That's, that's right. That's where I worked it out. Uh, and But it's leather reclining chairs. Yeah. And it's massively awesome. And you can have beer and you can have food and whatever. It's fantastic. And I would say the IMAX at the, the new IMAX at the Grauman's Chinese Theater, the mm. TLT Theater. Oh, yeah, that was nice. So fantastic. But my still, my best uh, Force Awakens viewing experience ever was watching it at that theater and seeing how lifelike that 3D really is. You really feel like you can touch what you're looking at on the screen. It's amazing. So that's, that's uh, Another one for me, Arclight, when when we're not talking about those kind of deluxe mm. things like AMC Prime or iPick, oh, okay. Arclight's regular yeah. screenings are, are, are some of the best. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and people uh, respect the Arclight too. People don't yes. go talking it on their phone. You don't see that at the Arclight. It, it's a very much a, like a movie fan, yeah. film goer uh, theater. Yeah. Uh, Sinead, what about you? What are your favorite places to watch movies? Um, well, if the, sometimes the El Capitan will do like mm. a special event when a movie comes out, and 
I always try to go to those because they decorate decorate the whole theater and they go all out. So you actually like feel like you're in the movie when you're in the theater, which is awesome. But um, it has to be the AMC Prime, mm -hmm. and it I'm is check just this out. I'm it's go to just so like I can't even explain it. To you. you don't even realize what you're missing until you sit in an AMC Prime theater because like Dennis said, the sound is incredible, the picture's incredible, but you're, it's so comfortable and you, have, you there's so much space around you. It's just, it's wonderful. I find people shut up more when they're comfortable, you yeah. know? Yeah. So like if they can recline and stuff, they're not, they're, they're not checking their phones, they're not talking to their friends, they're just maybe asleep, which is ideal. Yep. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for this episode of Collider Movie Talk. Thanks for joining us. I want to thank the people uh, at this panel today. Uh, Roka, where can people find you? Hey, guys, you can always find me at The Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram. See all the shows I'm hosting, co-hosting, and getting to be a guest on like this show. Thanks again for having me on today. Uh, and also, please, guys, watch us 2 p.m. every Wednesday, the Top 10 show here on the Collider Network. We just did Top 10 Superhero Villains. A lot of feedback on that, so a little bit of negative feedback on how things ended, but we're working things out. For those of you who actually watched it and are watching me now on this, we're working things out you know we're having figured out it's a transition situation so it's going to happen and also please listen to the cinephiles which is my new podcast that i do with a film professor friend of mine where we break down one film before the year 2000 one classic film before the year 2000 and talk about its legacy we just released reservoir dogs today uh, Mark Ellis. This Christmas, you can find John Roca and I back home on our farms in Virginia. Until then, you guys can catch me this weekend in Hollywood doing stand-up at the Comedy Store tonight and Saturday. And also time doing a special show at Meltdown Comics or the Nerdist Theater on Sunset Boulevard. So come on out, have some fun, 7 p.m. And Sinead, where can people find you? This weekend, I will be on Mailbag tomorrow and Sunday and then back on Monday hosting Collider TV Talk. And Wendy, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos. And see you on Mailbag this weekend or Movie Talk on Monday. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.